it to me. That may have been a little overzealous. Shush. My dumb sure is lucky. Don't bust your nut just yet. This is not a comparison video. There is no comparison between these two. Everybody knows it. This is a contrasting video. I'm trying to find out why one is such an awesome powerhouse and the other is barely qualified to put together a Fisher Price kitchen set. Nor is this gonna be a trash Harbor Freight video. The Chicago electric gun actually has some things I think Milwaukee could learn a thing or two from. Being less than half the price, you would expect this battery to be a little looser than the Milwaukee, but good lord, this Milwaukee battery slops around like I built it myself. Eh. The second area where the Chicago Electric scores points is style. Fight me in the comments, but I like the simplicity of this burgundy and black design. It hides the grease, and it allows the yellow buttons to easily stick out in a dark undercarriage. Why would you want bright red and white? It's going to make your tool look like crap after just one use. And as with most modern tools, this design would probably look better in Star Trek. I'm also sick and tired of old guys going, eh, good tools aren't cheap and cheap tools aren't good. It's true in this case, but it is far from a rule. Ball joint separator. 20 bucks from Harbor Freight. Never failed me once. I thought this thin little metal here would fold, but it has been solid as a rock. Same thing from the tool truck, 260 bucks. These color-coded 3 8 drive sockets are especially handy. Yeah, the collar's coming off a little bit, but you can still see it. The plan was to buy these and replace them with nice ones as they broke, but guess what? None of them broke, and even if they do, they got the same warranty as Snap-on. In fact, Harbor Freight's a lot closer than the Snap-on truck ever is, so frankly, I think it's a better warranty. 1300 cents. This $20 chunk of Chinesium is probably my favorite ratchet of all time. Long enough to break off a wheel lug, and short enough to fit in your toolbox. Cheap enough to use as a hammer, smooth enough to use as a ratchet, and again, same warranty as Snap-on, which, by the way, I haven't needed once. This thing has never failed me, even though I beat the crap out of it. Here's an assortment of quote-unquote good enough diagnostic tools that will all pay for themselves the first time you use them. Not to mention that every Predator 212 engine that I have ever owned has been a complete workhorse. All right, that's all the free advertising Harbor Freight's going to get. <coughs> Let's be real. This one's 10 times the tool this one is. Let's open them up, see what's inside, and see what's in the difference. Did you ever see the Jetsons meet the Flintstones? Yeah. Starting with the batteries. 1.5 amp hours from the Chicago Electric NICAD battery versus 8 amp hours from a similarly sized lithium battery. NICAD's rugged, but it's got the power density of a big block Cadillac post oil crisis. Even this itty little baby of the M18 range has a half amp hour on the Chicago electric battery at half the size and weight no less. Now Harbor Freight ain't picked NICAD over lithium for its ruggedness. It's all about extreme value engineering. That big M18 battery by itself costs more than this entire impact wrench, charger, and battery put together. Next up is the body. I sort of expected this to be made from melted down solo cups, but no, it's actually PA6 GF30. That's a common, polyamide, a common polyamide that I wasn't expecting in a tool at this price point. It's pretty good temperature resistance for plastic, and it's got 30% glass fiber reinforcement for extra rigidity. No surprise that Milwaukee's got the same thing. But come on, look at the difference in the quality of the molding. I'm never going to complain about how ugly this beauty is on the outside. Talk about your inner beauty. All of this takes tons of money to engineer and manufacture. It's so stiff. This guy... Eh, same material, but look at this. Even my scrawny ass was able to crack it. It's even more obvious on the other side. 
The Chicago Electric has so much room inside. My soul is more filled. You could have filled that with some kind of structure, but pennies cost dollars, and the Milwaukee, well, they spent the pennies. At least you got somewhere to hide your drugs if you buy the Harbor Freight one. As an engineer, I really love the simplicity of the Harbor Freight design. I just wish it weren't so gutless. This thing looks like it sold its soul to the devil to become the most powerful cordless impact on the market. The surface mount LED lens assembly is really impressive, but God help you if you look down the barrel and accidentally squeeze the trigger at 2 in the morning. This industry standard 5mm LED in the Harbor Freight is realistically good for 99% of situations, and it's a good example of value engineering over the Milwaukee. Just take a look at the battery terminals. Two. Just two. No temperature monitoring, no data communication, just good old fashioned positive and negative. And the same story with the trigger. Just a simple analog device with a beefy heatsink and presumably a potentiometer and a single MOSFET inside. Where's that transistor? There she is. If this thing ever craps out on you, that's what's gone wrong. They cost pennies. Making a MOSFET-based speed controller is child's play, really. They're super simple, but they're also really cheap, which is why they're perfect for a budget tool like this. Unfortunately, they're also pretty inefficient. Hooked up to the trigger on any cheap variable speed tool, there's a potentiometer, which is just a variable resistor. As you squeeze the trigger, the resistance of the potentiometer goes down, which allows the voltage to the gate pin on this MOSFET transistor to go up. Once this voltage to the gate pin passes a certain threshold, the MOSFET starts allowing more and more battery voltage to the motor, thus increasing speed. At lower speeds, any excess electrical energy is just disposed of by the MOSFET as heat, thus the heat sink, and the not so great efficiency. Well, that's weird. Wasn't expecting to see a chip. Here's the back of that MOSFET, clearly soldered onto the board in a sweatshop by a human. But this chip doesn't fit my theory. I'll have to see if I can get the numbers off this thing and do some research. SY069B. Well, I'll be damned. That's actually a pulse width modulation speed controller. This potentiometer is actually controlling the voltage to one of the pins on the chip. Well, that's gone forever. <sighs> Which tells the MOSFET to switch on and off at a varying pulse width. This is how pulse width modulation works. Instead of controlling speed by varying the voltage to the motor, this MOSFET actually switches a fixed voltage on and off in precisely controlled pulses. As demonstrated by these square waves. The longer the on time is relative to the off time, the higher the duty cycle is and the faster the motor goes. It's still not as advanced as what's in the Milwaukee, but this thing looks like it could outprocess Apollo 11. Down here's a little control board, presumably just to interface the settings buttons with the main motor driver board. I'm not a fan of complexity, but the ability to change torque settings is awesome. And it's just one of those things you gotta give up if you wanna keep it simple. Another nice benefit of all this control circuitry is this thing can actually sense when the nut has been broken free and reduce RPM automatically. Another thing you'll notice is that despite being a much more powerful tool, there's no heatsink on the switch. That's because the motor driver board does all the heavy lifting. There's almost no current flowing through this switch. Here we see a very complicated and delicate and important looking ribbon cable. We'll get to this in a bit. Looking at the motors, you can see the Harbor Freight's got a big chunker of a motor, whereas the Milwaukee's got this little bitty baby thing. It makes the power difference almost inexplicable. Almost. Pull this out and you see the key to all the magic. Beautifully made induction drive brushless motor. Little bearing in the front. Made in China, of course. A brushed DC motor like this uses brushes to maintain contact with the commutator bars and keep the current flowing while the rotor spins. It's worked fine for an eternity, but brushes can wear out, and of course these are unserviceable. Pound for pound, it's nowhere near as efficient as an induction drive motor. Here's the brushless induction drive unit in the Milwaukee. You've got these big beefy field windings and a small board in here. This Hall Effect generator board has three little Hall Effect sensors, magnet sensors. They detect the rotor as it spins, and keeps track of its position so that the control circuit, via that ribbon cable, can time the pulses perfectly and keep it all running smoothly. Let's we'll see if we can extricate this dinosaur out of here. There we go. 
This could be shop dust, but I have a feeling it came from the tool itself. Eesh. Nasty. This off-the-shelf motor has a little non-directional fan in here to keep it cool. And here we've got the hammer. It's a little small, but otherwise it doesn't look terrible. But this grease is nasty. The planet gears and planet carriers and the sun gear and the internal gear, they all seem to be made of the same kind of metal. Powdered metal, probably. Unfortunately, the thing that holds it all together is made of plastic. Maybe nylon or bakelite. I don't know what this is, but it should be made of aluminum. Here's the anvil. Nice piece of steel. Nice aluminum enclosure. This does not do anything. I guess it's supposed to keep the grease in. And here we have some needle bearings. Can you hear that? These bearings are shot. Now let's see what you get for the extra couple hundred bucks. Oh yeah, this is heavy. Nice to feel something girthy in my hand for a change. Much more detail in the aluminum casting. And no, uh, no needle bearings. This looks like just a bronze bearing. Or a bushing, I guess you'd call it. Nothing to break in there, really. It just wears out eventually. Just had to check. I'm not a greaseologist, but whatever grease that is, looks like it sticks much better than the other stuff. Yeah, those are some planet gears. They're monsters. No slop either, smooth as glass. Big, beefy ball bearing in here, too. Not shielded or anything, but that's good enough. And here you can see the internal gear pressed into the aluminum housing. Remember, this housing was plastic on the Harbor Freight model. No matter how powerful the motor is, it's the spring thickness that determines the maximum potential for your nut-busting ferocity. The weaker spring in the Chicago Electric isn't really a design flaw, but it really indicates that this is a beginner's tool, not a pseudo-professional tool like the Milwaukee. Using economy of scale to save a few bucks is a perfect example of value engineering done correctly. Case in point, the fasteners. Whoever designed this tool for Harbor Freight was able to save a couple pennies per unit without compromising quality by using identical fasteners throughout. I had to use two different Torx bits to get the Milwaukee apart, not to mention one, two, three, and four completely different screws to keep track of. Shaving pennies is the name of the game when designing a bargain basement alternative, and buying in bulk more than offsets the cost of overusing a screw. Just because I've got some nice things to say does not mean I recommend this tool. But I do think it's brilliantly engineered in its own funny way. Simple battery interface, off-the-shelf hobby-grade LED and motor. And yeah, the plastic won't survive a fall off the top of your toolbox, but a lot of tools wouldn't. One of the holiest tenets in engineering is the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. And these guys took that belief to the extreme. I just wish it was a little more... better. As of this recording, these things were recently discontinued. But for at least a decade, they were pumping these things out for less than the battery cost on a better tool. Speaking of which, let's see what this beast is capable of. We'll try the uh, lowest setting first, setting one. Cover the light there so you can actually see. Nice little LEDs telling you which setting it's in. This bolt is the same size as the wheel studs on my car. It would be super convenient if setting one got them secure, but not fully torqued. This thing easily has enough power to break a wheel stud or strip it out. And now we'll just see how much torque it takes to go a little further. 40 foot-pounds, that didn't do anything. We'll try 50 foot-pounds. Fifty foot pounds made it budge a little bit. Now let's try setting two. Golly gee, do you think it stripped the threads? Swish. I have some big nuts. 
Since even setting 2 is too powerful for a wheel stud, I'm just going to write off setting 3 as useless and go to max torque to see what it does to this 3 quarter inch bolt. You happy, Mom? Yikes. Good call on the safety glasses. Let's give Pop Pop's vice one more chance against the mighty Milwaukee. I just guessed on the socket size here, and Big Red punished me for it. Rounded right off. Money well spent.